Welcome to Family Business World. I'm your host, Dr. Dale Caldwell, with uh, Vincent Finaldi from Telecloud. Vincent, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Dr. Dale? Good, 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 good. Please call me, call me Dale. And so uh, I've gotten to know Vincent and his family, and they're doing a really amazing uh, technology communications uh, business. Uh, but as always, I want to start about you know, talk about your origin, Vincent. So where did you grow up, and um, you know, where did you go to school, and all that, all that good stuff? Absolutely. So uh, I think it's safe to say I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, Jersey born and bred. Uh, <laughs> I'm a North Jersey guy, so uh, born and raised in Morris County. I was right outside of Morristown in a small town called Florham Park, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, we were allowed to be New York Giants fans, but not Eagles fans from where we are. <laughs> very true. Very, very true. The, and uh, I ended up, uh, so, you know, born and raised in North Jersey. I ended up going to college at a small school called Fairfield University in Connecticut, which is roughly 90 miles north. Um, then came back um, and, you know, did the normal thing. Uh, lived in Hoboken for a while, then Morristown, and now I'm, I'm settled with my family in Florham Park. Well, well, Vincent, as you know, I, uh, I run the, the Rothman Institute of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Fairleigh Dickinson University in Florham Park, right near the, the, the uh, Jets, uh, you know, the Jets complex. And, um, and the Giants are nearby, and the Giants used to practice on, at FDU. So, uh, yes. you know, so we're, you know, we're the, the local fight. And, you know, I wish, I wish either of those teams could, could get much better. So, well, well, uh, well I know. Yeah, it's, I it's, agree it's, with you on that one. It's, it's really, <laughs> uh, really disappointing. But um, so, so, so tell me a little bit about the, the, the business and, and the family business and what family members are involved with Telecloud. Sure. Uh, so it started in, uh, you have to give credit where credit's due. Our father started the company, Michael Finaldi, back uh, in 1981, uh, you know, which is over 40, I believe it's, what is that, 40 years ago, if Un I do the math quickly. Unbelievable. So, so our father took the entrepreneurial leap and the risk and started a company selling, installing, and maintaining traditional phone systems for other businesses in New Jersey. So it, they're called interconnects, mm -hmm. or that was the term. So now currently, and as the years went by, the technology really rapidly changed right when the internet started taking over in the early 2000s. So the company shifted where my brother, Damon, who's my older brother, joined the company, I believe in 2005 or 2004 okay. in that time okay. frame. Our, um, our sister, Kara, is also involved in the business and myself, I joined after college in roughly 2006, 2007 time frame. And it really shifted in from a more of a traditional time of material service business where you service equipment to an internet cloud-based uh, provider. So you really had to adapt in order to continue to stay relevant um, through the years. So, so speaking of adaptation and uh, we, you know, we're, we're coming out of this pandemic, at least I'm hoping we're coming out of this pandemic, and uh, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what happened, you know, what, what was the impact on your business to, I mean, you know, and one way sure. technology was much more important, in other ways no, it's, it's a challenge. No, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, we were always, so our headquarters is in Union, New Jersey. So mm -hmm. we've been physically, like we're an office of 15 to 20 employees. Right. So that's a ballpark of our size. We're a, we're a healthy, small company. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were used to physically driving to our office in Union to work, collaborate, um, and do all the things you do to run a company. Mm -hmm. So in March of, was it last year when the COVID hit, we really knew we had to pivot. Uh, so we adopted more of a hybrid work from home model mm -hmm. where we still come into the office, but it's more for, uh, candidly, it's more for human interaction, right. training, morale. Uh, but we've run our company um, in a remote hybrid environment. And we found it actually, uh, in certain ways, it's better, as you know, and in certain ways, it's worse. Right. But most importantly, the clients were unimpacted. Like, we could still service our clients. Um, so we were able to do it pretty quickly and effectively. Yeah. The um, And so w what's ahead? You know, as you're looking, we're coming out of the pandemic with your family. You've survived. You've done well. You sure. know, what's what's uh, what's ahead? Because it seems like technology is changing just continually. You, you know, it's a great question. We found, so... From more of a macro perspective, like less out of our industry and more macro, we're seeing 2021 as the new world of work. We believe mm. after the summer and September rolls along, things are going to really start booming with the economy and business. Mm. And, you know, there's been enough of time where you can adapt for the businesses that are going to stay relevant. There's been enough time for that adaptation phase. So we believe in the new world of work that it's going to be a hybrid model right. where... Um, 
you take any SMB, whether it's a big company, mid-market, small company, right. depending on the industry you're in, but we believe there's going to be a work from home and an in-office hybrid approach yeah. where you're going to have to be able to offer that in order to retain employees, retain talent, and stay relevant, um, depending on what kind of services you provide. Well, it, it, it's interesting. I'm reading more and more articles. In fact, there was one today, I think it was in the Post or the Times, talking about the idea that you know employers didn't trust people working from home, but surprise, surprise, people are actually more productive when they're working from home. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah, and and so that you know, the, so the, I didn't get a chance to read the article yet, but it's saying, well, why was it that the, you know the assumption was 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 that, and and the results are this. So, um, you know, what what do you think? In in in, are there new technology? And and I know you, you're a very innovative guy. Are there things that you could do or on the road to really make this? virtual, this hybrid world, um, even more seamless. Absolutely. So I would say three things, a couple things happened. So in my world being in, I was always, we were always put in the box of a mm -hmm. uh, telecom company or mm -hmm. phone service provider. So we maintain, you know, phone systems, things related to all phone system technology. Then you had other companies like um, you might have a CRM program like a HubSpot or Salesforce. Then you other companies that did video. Mm -hmm. You think of Zoom. You think of um, th there's some other providers. Go to Meeting. We all use it every day. So I think what happened, Dale, is the lines got blurred, and c customers, businesses, people want kind of one solution for everything. Mm -hmm. So I think of the word collaborate. Mm -hmm. People want to have the ability to work and collaborate, no matter if they're in the car, working from home, or in an office. And what's Thank God that this pandemic hit. And I know it's a weird way to word that. Thank God the pandemic hit. But I mean, in 2020, not in 1995. Right, right. Because the technology was there to work mm. around it. Mm. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so things like video, uh, collaboration, communication, you know, you're always able to communicate with others quickly. Um, and I think that that really helped uh, make this doable mm -hmm. back uh, as opposed to if it was 25 years ago pre-internet i think it, it would have been too much for us to handle that that's a that's a great great point and, I, and i've often said that you will find that this whole video age now i'm a zoom person i do all i do them all but i really just you know i've just gotten so comfortable with zoom and and so on um sure. but but Vincent, I've been able to put together teams of people from across the country. We have a big event coming on May 30th on Sunday in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the 100th anniversary of the, 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 the tragedy, the race massacre that happened in Tulsa. And we actually are doing a, a Hall of Fame induction ceremony in Tulsa, but we're streaming it live. And I'm That's working great. with people from around the country that I've never met in person for the last eight months. We've been talking virtually every day. And so that wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for people being comfortable with video, video technology. So I think you're going to see all sorts of collaborations come out of this that never would have happened before. So as horrible, I mean, the, the, the deaths is just, it's so tragic. Um, but, but there is a, a silver, silver lining coming out of this. And so, so, so Telecloud, how does Telecloud help people um, in their homes, you know, have the technology necessary to do that sure. kind of streaming? So our place in the our our small pit place in this big universe mm -hmm. <laughs> is um, we we like to think of ourselves as we provide enterprise level phone technology to a small business. Mm. So it's very, whether you're ten people or fifty people, it's very difficult to know what to do with all mm. the different technologies. Yeah. So our place is we really help get businesses of various industries um, get them up to speed with things like. Um, you know, if, uh, for example, if a client calls in, you, you get the call routed to your cell phone. That's a basic example of unified communication. Mm -hmm. If you need to hop on an internal conference call with a coworker and see their face and talk to them, it's an example of intercom with video. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we also help the change management of swap. So a big part of what we do is swapping out old equipment and putting in the new equipment at mm -hmm. the office. So okay. there's, a, there's an on-site installation component to what we do okay. in addition to the service. So we, our place in, so far in the industry we're in is really helping clients communicate, innovate, and collaborate better in 2021 standards, whether they're a big company or a small company. Interesting. And, and so you're you're really technology consultants as well as, you know, the the technical the technical people providing providing those services. And so who are your clients, or or, or how do you find new clients? Well, we've been at this a while. Like mm -hmm. I mentioned, part of the advantage of 
of a second generation company is you have a customer base. So, mm-hmm. so we manage about 500 local businesses in New Jersey. I would say 95% of our clients are headquartered in Northern New Jersey, okay. Morris County, Union okay. County, Essex County. And we have a lot of clients with multi locations throughout the country, but we, we um, tend to play well where the headquarters is also local to right. us. And right. we leverage all the relationships we have, all the, the ability to be on site. Um, Cause we, we live in a world where you know, too much remote's bad too. Right. So, right. so we have the remote component of what we do for service and education, but there is an on-site component to physically visiting the client, putting in the new equipment, and and obviously servicing the equipment if if something goes really wrong. Right. The um, uh, do you work with many family businesses? Being one you yourself? know of our of our client base. Yeah. I, I've never done the actual math, but mm-hmm. but if someone you know, I would assume. 25 to 50% of our clients are family run. Right. Because right. you meet with them and then, you know, there's a, there's a cousin or a daughter or a parent. So it's very common, especially in that, um, you know, 25 to 100 person company. Mm-hmm. It's very common to be family run and operated. It's just kind of how it works. You fall into the trade a lot of times influenced by your parents. Yep. Well, well yeah. you know, one of the things I think is important is for family businesses to support family businesses. For them to, if given two equal choices, for them to go with you as a, as a family business. And so at Rothman, we started something called Family Business Week. It was the fourth week in October. We want everybody to support family businesses, but to really call the world's attention to family businesses. And so we're even thinking of having a contest to, to have people videotape um, only spending money with a family business on a particular day. So everything they do is, is going to be for, uh, for a family business because uh, uh, they are the backbone, not just of America, but of the world. And so uh, we need to really, really do that. So I even say even a marketing strategy that we're a family business and so on. Um, and, and so, Vincent, you don't know, I go to business and say, oh, are you guys a family business? And, and they, sure. they light up that somebody even noticed that, yeah. even cared that they, uh, that they were a family, a it, family business. It, it, it's interesting you say that. So putting aside like the industry we're in and the, you know, what we do for, for our day to day, a part of my focus lately has been what you just said. It's on second generational companies right. and all the, right. how important it is, I believe, for the legacy to live on. Because like you said, towns, societies are built a lot on family businesses and people forget that because you're so used to hearing, you know, mm-hmm. the Fang stocks, mm-hmm. Facebook, Apple, Net- Netflix, right. and they become the size of, you know, countries right. that it's hard right. to relate where, you know, you drive down Main Street, in whatever town you're in and, oh, there's, there's Tony's Pizza. I mean, that's right. a family run company. Exactly. And, you know, so I, I believe it's so important, whether it's a small run company or, or large or scaled or mature like that it's important we start focusing on how important it is that they stay alive and stay relevant and adapt. And, and you have to adapt. You yeah, can't it, just do it the way it's been done. Exactly. You've got to. Uh, so we're going to take a, a quick commercial break. And I want to stay on that because you're really doing some very interesting things with second generation uh, uh, family business leaders. So uh, Thanks, we will be right back after the break. Sounds great. So, I'm kind of new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek.
Welcome back to Family Business World. I'm with Vincent Finaldi from Telecloud. And so we were just talking about, Vincent has a, a personal project to really highlight the unique issues of second generation family businesses. So Vincent, tell the audience a little more about what you're doing. And I know you're, you're on social media and other things. So what, 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 are you, what are you trying to do with that? Sure. So, you know, we've all evolved, especially when COVID hit, we've all had over a year to kind of evolve in our, in the way we think, I, I'm sure we've all kind of permanently been changed. Yeah. So the one thing that came that's near and dear to my heart is family run second generational businesses. And it really started when COVID hit, you started seeing way too many small companies go out of business, right. particularly the restaurants, the retail trades, you know, the companies that were really hit hard by COVID, you, you had a soft spot for, yeah. especially really good establishments that had no business going out of business. Right, um, right. So anyway, Very good. to shift, I, I started putting a little bit of time and attention towards um, something I believe in, which is second generation and shedding light on, on these businesses and, and ensuring that they help thrive, you know, adapt and uh, that the legacy lives on. Because in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, I, it would really break my heart if the world was run by behemoth companies. Right, right. Um, you know, as much as they're wonderful and, and we need them, uh, you know, I don't want them to be the backbone of Main Street. <laughs> right, right. Driving, driving to our homes. Exactly, so exactly. I really love the subjects like, and a lot of times people don't realize like a family run company, there's so many interesting dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of the sibling dynamics, uh, the, the importance of adapting. I think of how important family health is. Because um, really, to run a successful family-run company, you have to be relevant to the market, but you have to be really internally healthy. Yeah. And uh, it's difficult to do that when you're a family. At the, it, it's hard to share the dinner table with the conference room table, as right. the saying goes. But it, it can be done. <laughs> And, 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 I, and I see as I talk to, you know, many different families, they do it very different ways. Some people have rules that we will not talk any business at the dinner table. You know, some people, they'll allocate yeah, it's time. Hard. It's hard because there's a crisis. You don't get a chance to see somebody during the day and yeah. you do that. And then, then you carry the, the, the kind of childhood baggage there sure. that, you know, when I was 12, you did this to me. So I've, right. I've, you embarrassed me. So I, um, you know, how do, how, do, how do folks overcome that? What, what advice do you have when it comes to those family business issues? So to give everyone a little more context, um, our second generation has been at this officially since January of 2014. Mm. That's when the, the transfer became official from our right. father to, uh, this, to his, his children, which is us, myself, mm. my brother, and my sister. Uh, so we've had about seven years of testing and through a lot of trial and error and mistakes, we, we realized a few things had to happen. First is we brought out an internal uh, operating system. It's called EOS, okay. Entrepreneur Organizational System. Okay. And it, it's popular brand if you Google it. Mm -hmm. And it forced you to have really clear roles. So mm -hmm. even though your brother, sister, cousin, father, it's like, hey, what's your role in this company? And there has to be, um, whether we like to admit it or not, there has to be um, a little bit of structure. Like, you know, let's think of military. Like someone has to be in charge of this. Someone right. has to be in charge of that. Right. And you really got to get over your own ego and, and realize the health of the business is more important than your right. feelings of who's reporting to who. Right, right. So that was a big change. I believe rolling out the internal system was very helpful. A couple other things we did is we did invest in coaching and, and we brought in some business oh, really? coaching and okay. we said, hey, this is where we're struggling. And we realized we had to uh, talk and treat each other like business people during the day. And mm -hmm. we can go back to, you know, giving each other, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a hard time after work. Right? Yeah, I could do spitballs at my sister after work, <laughs> not, not during work. <laughs> but, uh, but so it, it definitely takes time and attention. And but some things yeah. are not possible to change. Like right. there's a popular book uh, you might have heard of called Birth Order. OK, mm -hmm. famous yeah. book. Uh, mm -hmm. the, Dr. Kevin Lehman you know, wrote it. and It's a bestseller. Yeah. And he says, listen, if you're an only child, an oldest child, a middle child, the youngest child, you're not going to change that. Right. So you just have, I think you have to be when you're in a family run company, you have to be really open and transparent with your role, right. with your birth order, with where do you, and you have to share the same vision. So it's really something you have to work on internally yep. before I believe you can scale and grow externally. I, that, that's a great, uh, and really that's, uh, um, so I, I, I wrote a book called Intelligent Influence, and the reality yes. is the more you research it, you know, we're all products of our influence. And so, mm -hmm. you know, 
we can change those influences if we have stronger influences to counter those. And so you really are so far ahead. I love the fact that you're, you're kind of studying this and talking about this because every family business really needs to have these conversations. And so often, Vincent, as you know, they put it off, they put it off, they put it off exactly. until they got to deal with it. And that doesn't yeah, work. And, and another thing I've observed, not just in our own ecosystem, but in the outside world, I've noticed uh, there's too much informality in family-run companies. Mm. Like if you have, you know, an owner or two owners and the children come in, there isn't enough formality of right. the legalization of the paperwork. Buy sell agreements, cross, you know, insurance, God forbid something happens. Mm -hmm. And I and I think you get to a point where whether you are a one million dollar company or a twenty million dollar company, it, it's your livelihood and your life. No. And it becomes your baby. Um, yeah. and I think there has to be more of um a seriousness to the formality of it. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you're going to resort back to bad habits and, and family structure. Uh, you really have to put the business stamp on it. While you love and trust each other, you have to do both. But, well, well, yeah. and, and that's, that's a real, I mean, it's a family business with the, the weight on the business side. Yes. Right? And so, I think because so. that's why you're existing and that's why you're there. And so, um, sure. you, you know, it's, it's um, and there are some family business conferences. In fact, we were thinking about doing one in New Jersey. Maybe we'll talk to you about that to oh, work with some other groups to actually do a retreat kind of a family business, get family business people to come in and talk about exactly what we were just talking about now. You know, yep. that, kind of, that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah we, we will definitely we'll yeah, talk about that. You, you know, Dale, there's so many relevant complex issues yep. that you can't yep, cover absolutely. them. Absolutely. Like I, even another one just to throw out, all right, your second generation, do you want to go to third generation? Do you want optionality to sell? Right. What if one of the three siblings wants to exit? I mean, these are complex things right. that you cannot figure out in an hour over coffee. And, 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 They're going to take hours of serious thinking. Uh, but, and all hours of serious thinking, but also of, of, of that decision, but also thinking about what are you going to do if you get the money? I think, I think a lot of people assume that selling the business is the goal and the panacea and life is going to be great because I have a lot of money. <laughs> On the sailboat with the cigar. Yeah, exactly. Right? Sailboat with the cigar. But you look at a lot of people who've done that. You know, human beings need a reason for living. And, yes, and if you don't have a reason for living and all you have is as much money as you want, that is not a great, that's not necessarily a great life. But one of the challenges is, and I want you right. to address this, is that a lot of, you know, you know young people you know, hear the stories of my company didn't make any money, but I sold it for a billion dollars to Google because they, they don't, you know, they, they want to use my technology and that's what I yeah, want. Yeah. And so, so there are a lot of people who don't think about carrying on that family legacy and, and really sure. making, making the business sustainable. How do you counter that? Because you're, you're a lot younger than I am. How do you counter sure. that with well, your generation and younger? Our business coach, his name is, he's a local guy, his name is John Sheridan. Okay. And we, we asked them that and it wasn't like, we were like, hey, it's, how does one even broach the subject of exiting? Like, how mm -hmm. do you even talk about it intelligently? Mm -hmm. and, and his advice was, you want to run a business so well that somebody will want to buy it, but you won't want to sell it at that point because right. it's run so well. Right. So he's like, it's kind of a, a catch 22. Mm -hmm. By the time it's sexy enough where someone really wants it, you're probably not going to want to sell it. Because mm -hmm. right. so many of the problems that you're dealing with are going to be solved through better systems, better people, better structure, better you know, so it, it, it was an interesting advice. He's like, by the time you could even sell it for the number you'd want, you might not even want to sell it. it it's an interesting reality in, in today's world where it's, it's the same thing, which I, which I really disagree with, with banks, is that they'll loan to people who don't need the money, you know, until you're in exactly. a stage where you don't need the money. And, and, and when I talk to long-term businesses, most of them have been started with, with these things called character loans. That they sure. said, well, we know you're a good guy or a good woman, and, and so we're going to give it to you, even though you don't have any fundamentals. That doesn't yeah. happen anymore. And the same thing here wow. is it, that you, know, you, want, you don't want to try to sell your business when you have to. You want your business to be so successful that people are knocking your door down to try sure. to, to sell and it. You're not, and and, and, and you're are, not interested because you love what you do. And, right, exactly. And, exactly. You're, you know, and you're loyal to your, your staff, your clients. But yeah. It's not a dirty word either. It's just it's just something you have to be aware of. Yeah, and, 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 and you also have to have a vision, too. I think some people don't have a vision. And so where you are in technology, a good friend of mine is getting her doctorate in, in, in uh, cybersecurity. She, she's an expert in deep fakes, you know, wow. these, those whole, you know, the whole technology and other things. And so I imagine that there will be technology that will, will help you identify deep fakes. You know, which are kind of fake videos and fake kind of things. Have you seen anything like that, or is that as well as other it, things? Uh, is that is that in the cybersecurity? Cybersecurity, yes, yeah, cybersecurity oh, stuff. My goodness. So, 
Well, back to the business side. So we at Telecom, we partner with a lot of IT companies in mm. New Jersey. That's um, we tend to be uh, almost the extent like a phone arm of an IT company that doesn't want to directly offer phones. Right. So we've learned so much about cybersecurity through our IT partners, and it is very, very real. The, yeah. the threat, the importance. Um, so absolutely, it's something we've become educated on. Yeah, I mean, become educated, and, and I think there will be products, and, and I would guarantee that as, as long as you got, you folks are alive, you're going to be offering some some state-of-the-art yeah. products that it, relate to it, this. It's, it's funny you say that. So we don't want to be pigeonholed. You know, we've always been traditionally offering voice technology services to our clients, but yeah. it, it's not about that. It's just solving problems they need. Right. And in what I can almost guarantee in one or two years, we're going to have a whole another slew of products and services. Because it's not about the industry, and it's just about solving business problems for other people. Right. Uh, and how you get there is, you know, your own path. But I, I completely agree that for companies to be relevant, and you know, technology every one to two years is is it's out of control in right. the pace of change. You, right. It's very difficult to keep up. So you cannot be offering the same list. You can't solve the same problems in three years because there's different problems. Right. The, so, so what advice when it comes to, to kind of your industry and technology? Say I'm a, I'm a family business and, um, you know, I'm looking at different providers to get a, the state-of-the-art system. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for them? Who do they, you know, what, what, what should they look for when they're really looking to, to hire people like you? Sure. So if I was a small business, when I say small, I think of like a 20 to a 75 person company okay. that lack mm -hmm. technical internal resources. Right. You'd want to find someone who can help with an on-site deployment and mm -hmm. for an on-site change management. Because there's a ton of stuff with phone systems and computer systems. There's cabling, firewall switches. There's change management that's hard to, to figure out. Right. So my advice would be find a local partner. Right. Um, and the larger providers who do what we do, there's really good companies, Dale, who do what we do, Ring Central, Verizon, mm -hmm. um, you know, 8x8. These are large companies. Mm -hmm. The challenge is they're just too large to give the on-site attention to a small company. Right, so, exactly. So we're really coming up, we're almost like, think of us as the Pepsi to the Cola. Right, like We're just right. a smaller option, but we, f we fulfill a need they have that a larger company is not willing to fulfill at that size. Well, see, and that's, that's a really, really good point. And, and, and that really, to me, makes the case for family businesses. That, and there's some big family businesses, the Walmarts of the world, but these big public sure. companies just don't have the customer service. They don't care. Every one of your customers you care about and you know intimately. I tease, uh, you know, and I meet with, I talk, talk to business people every, daily. And, and, you know, sometimes it's like, well, we don't know if we want to, you know, Go with a small company or a large company i'm like if you do a billion in revenue it's very difficult to care about a thousand dollars exactly you just you just can't you can't they so the, the larger companies do really well with mid-market to enterprise and the small companies are sort of the like proverbial like uh what do they call them like a redheaded stepchild the like, red, they're the ignored red, red, ones exactly so we want to give them all the love and attention they deserve yeah. that's we are the same as them Excellent. So we tend to fit culturally, too. Well, you know, unfortunately, uh, Vincent, we're at the end of time um, uh, for the show. What's, uh, what's the website? How do they find uh, uh, Telecloud? Absolutely. Uh, if you want to learn more, you could just um, Google Telecloud Union, New Jersey. We'll pop up on the top, and it'll forward to Teledata Solutions. So we're rebranding our company from Teledata Solutions to Telecloud. Wow. You can find us on Google. Excellent. Well, Vincent, this has been, been a lot of fun, and uh, I want to thank the audience for watching. We will see you next time on Family Business World. Take care. Thanks, Dale. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. Good, good, good stuff. You too. Really good stuff.